Moira Gunn as our moderator. Moira Gunn, as many of you know, has been the low dulcet tone on NPR's Tech Nation for many years. She's based here at, uh, in San Francisco, at University of San Francisco. And she teaches media and science communication there. And if you haven't listened to Tech Nation or by Tech Nation, then I encourage you to go and download it because it's really in-depth, uh, beautiful content around what's going on in the biotechnology world and the tech world. Joining Moira is the Chief Science Officer of the Pharma Vertical Twist Bioscience, Aaron Sado, the Co-Founder and Chief Science Officer at Distributed Bio, Jake Glanville, and the Founder and CEO of IONTES, all the way from Cambridge, UK, John McCafferty. Today, the biopharma industry is in the midst of a renaissance, and it's equipped with new knowledge and tools to use antibodies to manipulate the body's immune system to achieve a desired therapeutic goal. This panel is going to explore this surge and how it will impact the industry and the patients that it cares for. I have instructed all of the panelists on no uncertain terms in the next half hour to break the backbone of the biopharma industry and to reform it live tonight on the Symbio Beta stage. And in that case, I would like you to put your hands together and give a round of applause to tonight's panelists. Terrific. Ooh, I can hear myself. I hope you can hear all of us. And since we're starting a show, this might as well be Tech Nation. So from San Francisco, I'm Moira Gunn, and this is Tech Nation. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, I do want to say that we have our panelists, and, and quite frequently we introduce everybody, but we don't know who is who by the time we get up here. Uh, all the way over there is John McCafferty. He's the founder and CEO of IONTIS. In the middle is Aaron Sato. He's the chief scientific officer for Biopharma and the vice president for protein engineering at TWIST, TWIST Biosciences. And then finally to my immediate left is Jake Glanville, who's the co-founder, CEO, and president of Distributed Bio. So we only have a half hour, so we got to really get to it. Uh, welcome to our session on synthetic uh, immunology, next gen antibody engineering. Um, uh, uh, another page. Um, and so I think we want to get a quick setup for how we got here in terms of engineering antibodies. And John, you were the, one of the inventors of antibody uh, phage display and the co-founder of Cambridge Antibody Technology, now Metamune. And I was kind of hoping you might start by telling us what is phage display and how did it change or enable what we were able to do? Yeah, sure. So back in 1989, I came across a paper by a guy called George Smith who had shown that he could clone a, a gene encoding a peptide into one of the minor co-proteins of a virus, a virus that infects uh, E. coli, so-called bacteriophage. And he was able to demonstrate the peptide was displayed on the surface and could be recognized by antibodies. So we had the idea that maybe we could do that the other way around. Maybe we could put the antibody inside the virus <coughs> and have it recognize targets outside. So in effect, we wanted to create a tiny package with the genetic information inside and the encoded antibody on the, the outside. And the great thing is it worked, and, um, and we've gone on over the years from that initial demonstration to construct libraries of maybe 40 billion members. So, so that's uh, like five antibodies for every person on the planet. So, and, and I'll give you yours on, on the way out. Um, so, uh, and from these libraries, we've been able to actually generate human antibodies to anything we like. Um, and the poster child, I guess, is Humira, which is uh, the world's biggest selling drug. And that came from uh, the Cambridge Antibody uh, Laboratory. And also, <coughs> we have this week, Frances Arnold, who won the Nobel Prize this year. Well, she actually shared that with George Smith, who I mentioned, and also my co-inventor, Greg Winter. So uh, it's had, had a big impact. It's just a, a very powerful technique for generating human antibodies to anything you like. <clears throat> and, and on its own, is it synthetic biology? Well, I guess what we did then and what we're still doing now is we're sort of ripping the, 
the, the human genome, or at least the, the rearranged antibodies that come from it. So I don't know whether that qualifies as synthetic biology, which I, I'm thinking is making synthetic variants of, of what nature provides. But even back then, <coughs> in 1990, we were making semi-synthetic libraries and we were making mutagenized variants. So we've probably been doing synthetic biology for 30 years, actually. Um, but I think what's, there's been a sea change in the last few years in terms of our ability to analyze sequences and synthesize them. And obviously, that's a, a big expertise of my co-panelists. So part of the reason that I'm interested in, in the answers here is what's next gen? We've been saying next gen for a long time. What do you guys think? What's next gen? So I think next gen is basically, again, from all the foundational work at Cambridge Analytics Technologies, really understand the entire repertoire of human sequences. And today, since we have the capacity to actually synthesize large amounts of DNA, we can actually create libraries that mimic exactly what's like in the immune system in humans. So it, I find that it's a fantastic time for us as antibody engineers where we can create these fantastic libraries and enable us to find really rare antibodies that would be very difficult to find in humans because we can utilize our understanding of the human repertoire of antibody sequences to actually synthesize a library and use phage display in many cases. Yes. And you mean doing this now, not soon. Yeah, so, I mean, in my mind, here are the two reasons why you should consider synthetic immunology sexy. Um, the first is that because of the amount of money poured into making antibodies as drugs, this has been the vanguard of a lot of synthetic biology, that we're many years ahead, and the things that we're learning in engineering antibodies could be applicable to the many other areas that this audience may be applying synthetic biology elsewhere, just because of the tremendous amount of money and attention, um, as John said, over the last 30 years. And, and the second sexy thing about antibodies is that with most other proteins, you can look around and you might find a couple hundred versions of that gene from different species, and nature teaches you a little bit about how it works. But with antibodies, every single one of you has about 100 million different antibodies produced inside of your blood. So there's this galaxy inside of you, and the like, person next to you has a different set. And we've been able to develop high-throughput genomic sequencing tools to look at hundreds of millions of antibodies that humans have created, and it's taught us the selection forces elected by evolution and by our blood on how to make better antibodies faster. And it's that combination of these selection systems that John described, high throughput ability to synthesize uh, the twist performs, and then the ability to use high throughput data acquisition and analysis to be able to construct populations of next generation antibodies. Well, I have to tell you, you've been on Tech Nation before, you'll be on again, but you don't get to say sexy <laughs> on NPR. There's nothing <laughs> sexy about NPR, trust me on this, trust me on this. Uh, now, what I do want to understand, everyone to understand, is I'm really in the bio-entrepreneurship end of thing in terms of uh, what I'm interested in, is to talk about, have each of you tell us what your companies do and how you dovetail or compete, or <laughs> or don't speak to each other. We didn't have to separate you two, right? No. <laughs> no, no, we're all friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, you start. Okay, so um, as you said in the introduction, I was one of the founders of Cambridge Antibody Technology, which for me was just such a transformational experience. I went in there as a research scientist, I grew up there over 12 years, and sort of came across all sorts of fantastic people and skills. So that kind of um, and then went back to academia for 10 years and um, I, I make the, the joke that some people are proud to be serial entrepreneurs. Well, actually, I'm a monogamous entrepreneur. <laughs> and um, I, had to, I had to wait 10 years before I was ready to start another relationship. With Lack company. commitment, the ability to commit. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, We've anyway. seen your kind before, John. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, no, I was broken hearted. That's what happened there. Uh, I was broken hearted <laughs> for all those years. Um, so and I could see back in uh, 2012 there was still a big demand for human antibodies. We knew what we were doing. Many of the other people who knew this were already, had already been acquired by others. And I thought if we were nimble and quick, we could set up a, an antibody oh. discover, discovery company. And so, so that's what we, what we did. So IONTAS is a, a bit of a hybrid company. We've been able to get it going without, so far without any external investment. We've, uh, we generate profits by generating human antibodies. <coughs> And we use the proceeds from that to, to generate some technologies. Uh, moving on from phage display, we've actually developed a mammalian display platform where now we're putting one antibody gene into every cell and using things like CRISPR to 
uh, insert it to a single site, and now we're making libraries of maybe 10 or more, 10 million or more uh, human cells, each expressing their own unique antibody. And combined with flow cytometry, we actually get to examine every single one of them. We do like 10 million data points over half an hour on a flow sorter, and we pick out the, the winners. And we've also invested in another uh, technology, which I think probably also falls under the umbrella of synthetic biology. So we've, we're taking cysteine-rich peptides from venomous creatures and fusing those into antibody CDR loops uh, to, to get the best of both worlds with a particular focus on drugging ion channels. So I get to have some fun with the technology development as long as I keep the money coming in the door. Well, you know, what's very interesting about this as well is we always think about venture capital and how much venture capital has to go into the biotech industry for any number of reasons. And you at Iont Iontis, I think I said that right, Iontis, and here you at Distributed Bio, both of you guys, your companies were able to sell things right away and not have to take in venture capital. I don't know about Twist, but... We've taken some venture capital. A, a little bit here and there. There's only one company I know in the big social media giants that didn't have to do that at all, and that was eBay. Made a profit right from the beginning. In fact, that's what launched it. Um, Pierre Omidar uh, writing a little program so that his wife could could auction off and find Pez dispensers, which is what she was uh, was really interested in. So it's a really interesting thing. We've got a lot of models here. Tell us about uh, Twist Bioscience. Where does it fit? So um, I head up a bio, I have Twist Biopharma, which is a vertical inside Twist. So about a year and a half ago, Twist decided to actually carve out some application areas to utilize the technology platform. So we already heard about data storage earlier today. Biopharma is the second um, application of our technology. So as an antibody engineer, I've been able to create a group inside the company um, and utilize all the fantastic products that Twist already has to make DNA at scale. And so as an antibody engineer, I, I find that I'm like a kid in a candy store. I can basically make genes on demand, I can create libraries on demand, and I can do things that I wasn't able to do in the past. So in the past, it might take me a year, maybe more, to make a single library. Today, I'm doing that on a monthly basis. So, and we're basically utilizing that platform to make a whole um, library of libraries, of proprietary libraries that we can go out and work with biotech and pharma to help them discover as well as optimize antibodies in the future. How about distributed bio? Cool, yeah. So distributed bio, again, is a computational amino engineering group. Uh, what we do is we come up with ways of combining high throughput data acquisition, so high throughput genomic sequencing and roboticized high throughput selections along with synthetic and natural DNA sources to, and, and carefully considered designs to accelerate the rate at which we can discover antibodies as drugs. Uh, the history of that has been really initially in pioneering a technique to use high throughput sequencing to figure out why the hell our libraries weren't producing more hits and, and how to improve the quality of those hits to make them better drugs that are shelf stable, thermostable, aggregation resistant, and non-immunogenic. These are the, the major properties you're considering when you want to engineer one antibody or even scale that to engineer 100 billion antibodies and make them all behave as well as possible. So along that path, we've, and the community, has sort of made some progress, but also some missteps. Um, when, as the synthetic technologies got better to produce synthetic DNA, people got really excited and they're like, sweet, let's go make a bunch of crazy antibodies. And that worked kind of, except that most of those didn't fold up properly and they weren't able to recognize their antigens because they drifted too far away from the selection forces that nature has, has used to govern producing useful prote proteins. So a lot of what we do at Distributed Bio is look at thousands of human subjects' antibodies from multiple different species to try to understand how to build antibodies that work, and then come up with engineering strategies to really we're, we have the hubris to stare into the face of nature and try to improve upon it, which is a scary proposition, but it can work sometimes. We can say, well, what do we want? We want a bunch of antibodies that behave like what our own bodies produce, except that we want them to be as thermostable and uh, and non-immunogenic as possible and be administered to as many humans as possible without accidentally creating a racist medicine that's going to look immunogenic in one, in one ethnographic group compared to another, for instance. And, and so we, we're iterating. This is a never-ending process, but we, we build libraries, we evaluate them and try to understand our needs and then impose that into the next generation. And, and that cycle has been accelerating in the last few years because of the explosion of new synthesis technologies, deep sequencing, and algorithmic techniques. Yeah, so that's what we do. So basically, you're all in the same business. 
Yeah. Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> Took a lot to. Sometimes you got to wait for the punchline. Then we have it. I mean, I think the point is there's lots of business out there. I mean, the biologics, biopharma space is huge, and it's and always how looking. You go about it's always it looking for more different. tools to basically attack that and basically create that next generation biologic. Well, let's get down. Oh, good. The business is booming because, you know, nature has spent 462 million years using antibodies as its drug of choice. Every jawed vertebrate has used them, and we've never found a species that decided, nah, I'm not going to use antibodies anymore. And so the pharmaceutical industry is increasingly learning how to use antibodies instead of other technologies as drugs for us as well. And, and that's why business, business is booming for all of us. Yeah. It's true to say there has been an explosion. So when CAT started, in 1990, there was one single approved antibody, which was a mouse antibody. And actually, at that time, antibodies had a bad smell about them because there'd been all this promise about magic bullets and so on. And what people hadn't realized initially was that, that you're going to get a, a human anti-mouse response if you just shoot in a mouse antibody. And of course, the mouse, uh, constant, uh, the mouse FC regions didn't interact properly with the human ones. So when, when we started, there was one approved antibody. I think today, there's about 70 approved antibodies with sort of hundreds coming through behind those, so many more to come in, in the years that follow. Well, let's get down to essential skills. How much of this is information and technology and computer science? How much of this is lab work? And, uh, you know, you've been saying libraries. Are we talking libraries of physical antibodies? Are we talking libraries of data? Are we talking both? What are we talking about? So yeah, it's physical. When we're talking about libraries, we mean we can lift up a tube and there's going to be a galaxy of antibodies in that tube, like 100 billion unique human antibodies in a tube. And the reason you do that is that we can sift through that to find an antibody, a drug, against just about anything we want. It's a brute force attack using uh, the, the power of DNA to create the product, the instructions to create a product, and be able to create huge numbers of them in a small searchable tube. Uh, that's that tube has about the same number of antibodies as if we took all the antibodies from everybody in this audience, which is, by the way, about the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a really powerful technology to massively brute force any given drug target problem. And even though that sounds big, we still struggle with lots of problems on populating 100 billion members. And that's what each of us as experts in, is coming up with ways of, of, of optimizing that population to build a better galaxy. And where does the computer go? Oh, go ahead. So I was going to say, um, um, as I was growing up, you were either one thing or the other. You were the Beatles, or you were the Rolling Stones, or the Beach Boys, <laughs> or whatever. And, you, and in some ways, when I was growing up in this uh, antibody world, you were either the selection guys, which, which is where I'm firmly rooted, or you were the data guys, and it was always a dream that you're going to design antibodies de novo from scratch to whatever you want. And, but I think what's, what's happened, I think the, the, the future is somewhere in between where using the power of selection technology such as phage display and mammalian display, one can interrogate these massive repertoires, but at the same time interrogate them at depth and go through a process of iteration and learning and improvement. So I think that, I think that, that you no longer have to just choose beetles or rolling other? stones. <laughs> Good. I, mean, I definitely agree with that. I think you have to... Design is really key, um, as well as the display platform to basically sift out those antibodies. But then on top of that, also the ability to make lots of things and do a lot of testing. So again, the a really nice attribute of working with Twist is you can make hundreds and hundreds of genes to then enable you to make lots of antibodies to test as a physical protein. So it's really, in my mind, those three applications. And so it does involve a fair amount of lab work. Um, but, it's, but it's, in my mind, kind of a 50-50 correlation between design and creating that library and then actually the implementation and the doing of the, the make test cycle. Distributed bio is a drive-by window, drive-through window. Did you know that? <laughs> is that drive, good? Drive-by window? Yeah. yeah. Just like I, <laughs> you call on your phone on the way. Yeah. No? OK. It's, it's getting faster. The, <laughs> the cool but frustrating thing about our current state of affairs in biology, which, which is why we have these libraries, is that we cannot currently look at a DNA sequence of an antibody and predict what it binds to. If we could do that, we wouldn't need libraries anymore, right? You just run a simulator, and then you'd find a target. But that technology has evaded us, because it's about as hard as the folding problem. And in some respects, it's much, much harder, because the folding problem is a limited string, which self-anneals. Um, for that reason, that's why we have these huge libraries. And, and we spend a lot of time either the rational approach, which so far has failed, the natural selection approach, and then somewhere in between where you go, can we use lots of data 
to get better insights on sort of how to optimize our distribution of probability of success. So it's a probability density, density function that we're trying to optimize. And then can we use increasingly sophisticated synthesis technologies mm -hmm. to be able to manifest that, that library design. And for a while, the, the ability to sequence and analyze was ahead of synthesis, which was very annoying. Because I could be like, oh, I can see what the problem is. But it, the technologies to synthesize a correct solution do not yet exist. And that is the exciting period we're emerging into, is we have these increasingly sophisticated synthesis techniques that can live up to the theoretical statistical designs that we're envisioning. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, I always ask this of companies, and I, I really think to understand the core of what you're doing here as a company, this is just strictly from a company standpoint, where is the intellectual property in the company? Is it computer algorithms? Is it in your physical libraries? Is it in your ability to analyze, your ability to construct? Where's your intellectual property? I mean, it definitely can exist in the design itself. Um, so how you're you know, putting together all these pieces of data to actually create a unique library. Um, it's also the way you pan or screen the library. So we talked about phage display, mammalian display. People are constantly coming up with different display technologies. And then the final IP that you can get is once you have antibodies that bind specific targets, then that's really the rich IP that you know, really creates all this value that Biopharma is all excited about. Because we can go out and license that or partner with other companies to actually develop and create those next generation of therapeutics that impact patients. Same thing there? Well, as, as one of the inventors of Phage Display, I'm delighted that Phage Display is now just firmly a tool in the toolbox. Um, you know, Lots of people can do it now. The top 20 companies in the world have people doing fade display. So I'm not sure how much intellectual property there is there today in the, the methods uh, of that. But we, in our place, we've, uh, as I say, been using that as a core thing to generate revenue. And we've been investing in, in, in new things like mammalian display and opportunities there. Uh, the ability, in our case, to, to dial in developability of antibodies in a way that's unique, I would say, to uh, mammalian display. So that, those are the places that we, and, and the, the not body platform, which is, I say, this fusion, is, these are where we are uh, uh, generating I mean, IP. Can, yeah, I mean, that's a great, another great advantage of the synthetic libraries is that we can create a really rich source of antibodies that have a lot of these developability risks removed. So even sequences in the natural human repertoire have developability problems. But we can actually have the knowledge to sift through that and create things that will not have, potentially not have problems as we do develop these antibodies going into people. And so again, those are also things that you can, you can get IP around, the ability to get rid of all the things that might lead to problems down the road that actually might allow us to be successful in the end. Anything to add to that, Jay? I mean, the, the most valuable IP are the drugs, right? And that's the easiest thing to create. IP around because you're talking about a specific molecule and then there's something called the Cartan-Martouche group. So it's an area around that, that molecule that you're also protecting because of the nature of protein space. You can change a series of residues and they could be neutral drift or even beneficial. Um, then above that, you have sort of genus patents and more general protection around specific library designs that are non-obvious or use a technique that others haven't used before. And what you're doing there is essentially sandbagging other people from copying you for a while. Um, and there's other more sophisticated patents you can, they're harder to prosecute, but they're around unique processes using computational methods um, or specific uh, strategic use of statistics and laboratory process to be able to discover hits against targets that are traditionally very difficult. Like we have a way of going after GBCRs and ion channels using a combination of statistics and a selection strategy that's pretty unique. And so we've created some IP around that to, to give us a unique advantage to prosecute that. And that's really an advantage of having big libraries uh, and having the ability to sequence them occurring selection and then knowing how to play the, apply this trick on the library st panning structure and the data to be able to recover these antibodies against these traditionally incredibly hard targets and be able to do that routinely. I mean, Jake's right. So. The, the area that you can really get a ton of IP around is basically you can, un, you can basically allow for technological feasibility, where you can basically create a technology and create a library that allows you to go after a target that no one else can go get to because they don't have the, the library that actually can access that antibody that can bind to it. So, you know, we've been able to create antibody libraries to GPCRs as well, and actually was, was a collaboration we have with Distributed Bio, where we were actually able to now pull out antibodies against this really difficult to drug class of targets. It allows us to have that kind of IP advantage because no one else can do it because the targets are so hard to go after. I would also say that the, there's a heap of formats where people are fusing different things together. It's like wallpaper when you see the paper summarizing all the kind of bi-specifics and tri-specifics. I guess there are many people 
generating or trying to generate IP on novel ways of pulling pairs or triplets of binders together to create some new function. I guess also there's been a lot of uh, work around things like chimeric antigen receptors. We are now putting antibodies into T cells to, to target those to tumors, and there's multiple problems that have to be solved there also generating IP. So there's plenty of problems still around. Now this is clearly a multidiscipline effort. A lot of different disciplines. Nobody's good at absolutely everything, but you gotta work as a team and find them. If someone in the audience wanted to get into computational immunoengineering, or they want to invest in it, they're almost all looking at what's the, the total capability that you need. What are the essential skills? How can you enter this field? So my feeling are the most important, and this is what I tell everybody that comes in from, you know, from Stanford or from USF or these other groups that I interact with, is first understanding evolution. So population genetics is going to be one of the most powerful tools you're going to be able to use to apply a statistical framework to understand selection pressures in these libraries. Um, after that, it's uh, heavy-duty protein engineering. I think people talk about computational immunology, but by itself, that's a very passive act of just, you're basically just, you, you're a, com a computer scientist that happens to be looking at data that's immune-related. But once you combine that with engineering, then you're a, you're a force to be reckoned with because you have the ability to undergo iteration cycles in one of the most productive areas in medicine. Uh, and so that would be the area. Learn, engineer, learn the bioengineering, learn the immunology from a theoretical basis, and then uh, spend the time picking up population genetics. Aaron. Um, you know, I'll probably put it more simply. I mean, I, I often find sometimes... <laughs> it's okay, Jake. <laughs> you know, it's okay. Jake's a complex guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, is, uh, you know, I think oftentimes scientists are actually criticized for not being that creative, but I actually think they're very creative. I think to be an antibody engineer, you basically have to, you know, bring in all the technologies, all the knowledge around you, and also leverage people around you as well to, to really um, understand the field you're in, as well as apply all the tools at your disposal. And so that's, to me, as I'm getting back to my point before about working at TWIST, it's, it's really nice to have um, people that really aren't in the field of antibody engineering, but are like experts in molecular biology and all these fantastic DNA tools. And, I, and to think about ways to apply that to antibody engineering has been something that I've really enjoyed um, working with a lot of my colleagues at TWIST. So I am going to challenge that a little bit. And uh, I'm going to make a case for the value of the hybrid scientist. And, and that is when I was at Pfizer, and working with, you know, we work with 50 different pharmaceutical companies that are our clients. I, I think the biggest error that happens when a program moves forward, it's not that somebody was like, oh yeah, I'm just going to mess this up, right? It's, it's the error of the gaps between individual departments that have different expertises, where something drops because of a miscommunication. And, and both groups blame the other side, where the truth is it was a lack of, of integration of understanding between like, the protein production group to the kinetics group, the kinetics group to the panning group, and so forth. And I think the, that microcosm is true in groups as well. So if you have a group of four people in a room that need to get together to be able to make a decision about something, you're going to have an error of the gaps conceptually. So to the extent possible that we can incorporate these concepts, so the bioengineering, the immunology, the math, into a single person, you, you're going to create an iteration cycle of conceptual coherence. And so I think you do need some of these people, and that's going to be the generation of immunoengineers that are going to help drive some of these technologies forward. So that is my opinion, but that is the case I'm making, that you need some of these individuals. And that's what we focus on at Distributed Bio. And that's Sarah Ives you saw speaking, and Ashani, and some of the other people in my group that are computational, immunological, and engineering at once. And I think that's part of the reason why we managed to achieve significant success with a small team and without venture. And, and it's not easy. I, I have degrees in both science and uh, engineering. And when I worked at NASA and I had an argument with a scientist, they go, oh, she's an engineer. An argument with an engineer, oh, she's a scientist. Two different ways of thinking, many different ways of thinking. And it's not just the facts and underlining, but how you think and approach yeah. that can really change. Yeah, I mean, I definitely, things. I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think I always say antibody engineers are jack of all trades. They have to learn so many things. They have to learn how to, about, how to design libraries. They have to know how to pan them, screen them. And they have to be protein biochemists. And they have to know all these different areas. So um, I totally agree with Jake. And it's, it's, you really have to understand all these different areas and how they can, you can bring them all together. And then That's you can the joy then of it. work with those experts to really. Um, enable you to get to the finish line. John, you get up in there. Well, you, you asked the question, how, how would you get in, into this area? I would say employ someone who knows how to do this stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it's also good to have people that have a fresh perspective, too. Yeah. Like, 
bring in people that are new to it and they can give you a and you can train them first of all but also they can give you unique perspectives that you may not have ever heard before now a, a quick question here you two are US based companies you're based in Cambridge England is is there a problem with any of that how does that work how do you make that work um, not a problem. I mean, so far we've been able to sustain the model for the last six or seven years, basically generating income on a fee-for-service basis. Quite a lot of our clients are in the US and we're over here quite regularly, probably knocking on the same doors that these two guys are, are knocking on. So that, that's been okay. Uh, we've not been at a point where we're looking for investment and I suspect that we'd probably find richer pickings on this side of the, the pond. The money's here. I mean, I, the money's here. I, mean, I think it's, it's really good to be in a hub of innovation and biotech. Cambridge is definitely one of them. And yeah, so absolutely. San Francisco and Boston are the other two. Now, just to wrap up, each of you, 20 seconds. What's the hardest? I know you guys are all thinking about stuff. What's the hardest thing you're thinking about right now you can't for do? For me at the moment, uh, I got into this because I love the technology stuff, and this was a way for me to, to get on and do stuff without having to bend the knee to the, the VCs or the grant bodies, but it's getting harder, it's getting more competitive. There are two. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so the ability to keep funding the research in the way we've done is hard. So I think we are gonna to have to change the model and spin some of the things out that we've been working on. Great, Aaron. Um, You know, we were talking about money before. I mean, the, uh, there is a lot of competition and there's a lot of really smart people, just like the people up here on the stage. And so there is a lot of competition um, so trying to find ways to differentiate yourself in terms of what you provide versus others and also um, try to create systems and technology to really allow you to rapidly go and get things into people um, is a big challenge for me and so and it probably will continue to be a challenge for me for the rest of my career. Jay? Well, I mean, I agree. There's more competition. Um, hey, so two people were so scared they didn't show up. <laughs> 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 Which is good. Um, like the, the field's maturing, and we're entering an area where there's sort of like phage display, but now like by specifics and some other technologies have become more widely available, yeast display. So there, there are more tools for us to compete with each other on. So we've entered a global partnership with Charles River Labs that lets distributed biotechnologies be globally available. And they're a 14,000 person company, so they really let us kind of project the technology out. And what it's let us do is perform some navel gazing to look to ask ourselves not can what we do for, for partnerships, those, those 50 clients, but what's the really hard poor problem that we wouldn't risk offering to someone else, but we could risk applying internally. And so we, we've done that and we've managed to find uh, some pretty exciting developments on targeting um, broad spectrum antibodies against polymorphic pathogens, uh, vaccine technology, and also rapid antibody discovery technology as a consequence of computational immunology. And so we're getting ready to spin that out as a separate entity. So that, that's been occupying my mind quite a bit. And you're going to hear some pretty cool updates on that over the next few months um, because we've got pretty exciting results on a, a permanent vaccine for flu that you don't have to change every year and a rapid way to make uh, broad spectrum antibodies against viruses like HIV in a number of weeks. So that, I think that's the thing that I, I'm focusing on now. You should also focus on how long 20 seconds is. Sorry. But other than <laughs> 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 Thank you, you've been a great audience. John McCafferty from IONTIS, Aaron Sato from Twist Biosciences, and Jake Glenn Landville from Distributed Bio. For Tech Nation, I'm Moira Gunn. Thank you.